Hi and welcome to the Philosophy Film Club and uh, today's show is on a Game of Thrones. We have the fifth season I believe coming out this Sunday and uh, we will primarily be talking about the fourth season in this particular show but with references to the previous seasons before that and you know we might offer some thoughts about what the future season perhaps will offer us you know but I wanted to talk a little bit about my thoughts before we go into that call um, about the story and about the series in general Um, people either love this show almost obsessively love it um, or they're kind of indifferent to it some people have said to me that they the reason their indifference part of the reason for their indifference is the graphic violence which is quite disturbing and whilst I agree it is kind of disturbing I mean there are some scenes that I can't watch or uh, certainly can't re-watch I mean I might have watched them originally because I didn't know they were coming <coughs> but um, whilst they they are they do exist uh, some very unpleasant violent violence in it um, I do think it has a point but I think I asked people what was so interesting for those that really loved it I said what was so interesting and I will say that I got a lot of vagueness back <coughs> you know albeit kind of sophisticated vagueness but you know it was vagueness I mean in the sense that oh the drama's great or you know um you know the um, characterizations, um, those kind of things. They were really engaging, etc. But you know, pretty vague, really. Generally, I mean, I get that. I mean, I think I fell into that category to some degree myself, and it's only really been in the last couple of weeks since really studying this particular season and trying to understand and make sense of it from a philosophical point of view that I found it much more deep than I'd well that I'd always suspected it was but um, I think I kind of um, began to really understand it more and um, and there's um, I guess there's three things technically that connect that are great allegories in this show and I think they don't just reflect on the fourth season I think they reflect on the on the story as a whole (coughs) you know but I mean we do concentrate in this particular call we concentrate on the fourth season but um but there are three aspects and there's p- possibly two and the third one is the effects of the first two but the first one being the family uh, the family is an important allegory in this show um the relationships between siblings, parents, the wider family and cousins, etc. How they connect with each other, how they interact with each other, um, the power plays amongst them, etc. Um, very, very interesting. Very strong part of the story. The second one, which again kind of relates to the, the first one, family, but the second one is mythology. And not always in the most obvious aspects of mythology, which would be religion or, in this case, the uh, superstition, uh, superstition revolving particularly around the White Walkers, etc. Not just those things, but also the mythology of the way people interact with each other politically. Uh, people are walking on eggshells. People are constantly hedging their bets around people. Lots of things are unsaid um, amongst people, and said amongst others, allies, and you know. So it's it, this is a world of suspicion, you know. And you know, you have superstition and suspicion, and they're kind of almost related a little bit. And so from a philosophical point, mythology, I think, is a really, really important allegory in this particular story. And I think, interestingly, it's what connects people in the wider world, in the outside real world, um, with the story. 
because I think a lot of this stuff we deal with in our everyday lives or a lot of people do deal with the mythology of culture mythology of politics sometimes the mythology within their own family um, so there is this part of the story that connects with the real world and um, the last thing which is perhaps not so much an allegory although it becomes an allegory of a sorts but it's the effect of the first two allegories which um, is violence um, the effects of the family of family relationships the facts um, the effects rather of um, the mythologies normally erupts in violent violence of some some kind or another and so I think those three things bear you should bear in mind perhaps as we go later into this call I'll perhaps discuss them a little bit further at the end of this call and uh, you know to sort of crush out my thoughts about it a bit more in detail but um, anyway the this call is just um, between three of us um, that's myself and Adi of course and um, but we also have a guest Pim fr my friend from Holland uh, Pim and myself we've been discussing these movies privately with each other I guess over the last at least the last couple of seasons and Pim has a great knowledge of the books he's read the books all the way through the season uh, he won't be giving any spoilers away by the way but um, just thought I'd add that before before you listen to the show thinking there might be spoilers there are no spoilers at all um, and uh, but his take on it's quite interesting I mean he was my first choice because of his knowledge of the books etc which I think for us are the mainstay of people that watch this series our TV viewers I, not many of us have read the books so he can offer he does offer some very interesting insight into the background history of characters um, some of the differences between the show itself and the actual story so um, yeah it's, um, he, he was he's was a great contributor to this um, particular call um, so anyway we're going to start off the call Aidy's going to give her a brief introduction to her thoughts and feelings about the, um, the series thus far and um, I think I'm going to let her take it away and bye for now Okay, AD. So, tell us your introduction for the uh, for Game of Thrones this week. So, uh, yeah, Pat, it was um, it was hard for me to get into the series. To tell you the truth, um, I found the first two or three episodes very, very confusing. So, I remember I had to watch them a couple of times, but uh, when I finally got through them, uh, this series really captured me, and and then I couldn't stop watching. So, um, so far I watched the four seasons twice and of course I'm really, really eager to see what the fifth season will be like uh, and this is going to happen uh, here shortly. I cannot wait for it. So, this series is obviously centered around the idea of power and uh, the questions at the center of this story are where does power come from, who has it, who wants it and, you know, how it is used. And um, there are countless of scenes in which the show tries to answer all these questions. But one of the most notable scenes, in my opinion, is the conversation between uh, Lord Varys and Tyrion in the episode, I think it's titled, um, yeah, what, what is Dead May Never Die. So Lord Varys tells Tyrion a riddle, and uh, it goes kind of like this. Three great men sit in a room, a king, a priest and a rich man. Between them stands a common sellsword. Each great man bids the sellsword kill the other two. Who lives? Who dies? In this riddle we are given the three elements of power, the state, religion and wealth. Now the fourth element present is of course force, which uh, in this particular riddle is the sellsword. So, where does power reside and who actually gets to use force and manipulate people into violence and murder? Is it the state? Is it religion? Or is it the wealthy? Tyrion's answer to this riddle is 
depends on the cell sword. And Lord Varys seems to agree. He says uh, power resides where men believe it resides. It's a trick, a shadow on the wall, and a very small man can cast a very large shadow. So according to Lord Varys, power is just an illusion. The one that can manipulate the minds of men will ultimately have the most power. But then in the show we have uh, Tywin Lannister who seems to think that power comes from allegiance to family and uh, blood ties, while on, on another side we have Daenerys Targaryen who believes that freedom and individuality is where the true power resides. Then there is poor, poor Ned Stark who blindly believed that honor and loyalty was power and he lost his, his life for, for this mistaken belief. Then we have uh, other characters like uh, Littlefinger who in one of the, what I think it was one of the most captivating scenes of the show, tries to stand up to Cersei and tells her that uh, knowledge is power. But then she quickly proves him wrong, seeking her guards on him. So uh, uh, then s stopping very short from cutting his throat, she looks him right in the eye and tells him power is power. But um, <clears throat> then we have uh, Stannis Baratheon, whose power comes from religion and his crazy cultish rituals, while, you know, the Tyrells are drawing their power from their wealth. So if we look at the Game of Thrones, not necessarily as a show where powerful people fight for even more power, but as a battle of concepts or ideologies, it becomes a very different and a much, much more interesting show to watch. And now this is not to say that the show is not already extremely intriguing and captivating, but if in the Game of Thrones each character represents a different idea of what power actually is, we can see that each time a major character dies or is defeated, his or her concept of power is proven wrong. And so far we have learned that <clears throat> of course, honor and uh, loyalty will definitely not grant you any power, quite the opposite. I mean, Ned Stark and most of his family is dead and scattered. But what about freedom? What about family, knowledge, wealth, religion, and, and most importantly, illusions and manipulation? Which one of these is the key to holding power? Now, the battle is still ongoing and, and all these concepts with, the, with their characters that represent them are, are still in the game. Some rise higher than others, but none of them have won the battle just yet. The next season uh, will be airing soon, and I'm, as I said before, I'm very, very eager to watch the further developments in this battle for power, but um, I am also extremely curious to see which one of these ideas uh, George R.R. R. Martin will pick to be the winning one. Uh, although I have not read the books and I have no idea how the story is going to unfold, I think the Game of Thrones is, is likely to follow the formula of another movie, if you guys remember the Highlander um, and the catchphrase mm. of that movie, in the end there can be only one. <laughs> so at the end of, of, of the first season, if you remember, uh, Cersei tells us that when you play the Game of Thrones you either win or you die. So I'll be watching to see which idea of power and which character will remain standing in the end. And, and, and uh, I'm very, very grateful that Pim is here with us because, Pim, you are a book expert. You are our book expert in this podcast. So without giving anything away, what, what can you tell us about this uh, slow plus process of, uh, of elimination that the Game of Thrones seems to be structured around? Yeah, I, uh, my compliments on your, your introduction, it was very extensive and I think very insightful um, and I, I certainly agree with uh, a lot of things that you mentioned about uh, a power and the different views uh, um, of the different um, families and their or, or dynasties I should say um, I, I, I would like to point out uh, Game of Thrones is the, uh, the name of the first book um, and the series took the name on because uh, 
it was a, a nice name and it was a little bit of a pilot and, and could they get away with this? Is this something that people want to see? It was super expensive and it was not necessarily a um, market proven uh, a niche, so to say. But uh, I think the Game of Thrones uh, no, I I think power the 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 story is able to fit into the overarching storyline of the series, which is called a Song of Ice and Fire. So, in my opinion, what is going to happen is uh, we are going to see at some point in the future a clash between ice and fire. Mm -hmm. So the ice uh, being the north and the fire being Daenerys Targaryen, I suppose. I suppose, yes. Yeah, that's that's quite an interesting idea. I was certainly, I sort of thing I liked from your um, introduction, Eddie, was your uh, talking about power and stuff. And I was, I was uh, brought this. This um, was the first time in this particular series where we were introduced to the Iron Bank, <laughs> which I thought had um, great parallels to the modern day, of course, and. Um, and some, somehow I feel, or I feel that somehow the power might lie there somehow, but um, I could be wrong. Oh yeah, the scene where uh, Stannis Baratheon goes to the bankers, I think that's also one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, it's, that, it's really powerful, especially when he, he has to wait, you know, the king has to wait, uh, they have a they they don't have any regard of, of for right. for the crown for all these titles. I mean, they even say we are we are guided by numbers here. They're very <laughs> very rational in their in their approach. You know, I mean, they're businessmen. Yeah. And of course, I love the fact that they they uh, as as pretty much the bankers, the great bankers of the world, they support both sides of the war. Ensuring themselves uh, 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 a certain victory, no matter mm. which sides wins. Yes, it doesn't really matter to them too much. No. I would like to um, to add one more thing to your um, to the story that you mentioned about Varys talking to Tyrion about the three uh, the three guys in the cell sword in the middle. And I think that uh, one thing that is consistently true throughout the series is that uh, people who are banking on one particular aspect, uh, on either religion or either uh, wealth or either uh, some concept of honor or duty or something, um, they don't end up very well. And so I think that the answer to the question has something to do with, um, with balance. Um, and one thing that I find, for example, particularly interesting in that regard is uh, Arya's survival. Um, Arya is, uh, as when she Ooh. comes to King's Landing, she is taught how to, uh, as she says it, water dance. Uh, and I think Arya is consistently uh, dancing with her fate. And uh, it turns out she's a pretty good dancer. Yeah, it's really interesting to see Arya's uh, evolution, I mean, from uh, an innocent but eager to <laughs> to learn and to achieve uh, greatness from an innocent child um, to what I th where I think it's going, her faith and her destiny um, uh, in the story, I think she's headed for psychopathy because she turned, she's slowly turning, actually she actually turned into a ruthless killer and uh, a young young girl like her uh, presenting those traits, uh, I mean that is uh, really disturbing to see mm -hmm. a child uh, reduced to that, that uh, state. Yeah. Yes, her her evolution in that regard. I mean, it's sort of also to some degree you see that change happening with Stansa as well, um, particularly towards the end. Not to the same degree, of course. Arya's had far more trauma in that sense. Yes, um, towards the end, Sansa even she even changes clothes mm. and she's now dressed in black and uh, very much like uh, it reminds me of a evil witch you know, uh, the kind of clothing that she wears and the expression on her face when she comes down the stairs to meet yeah. Littlefinger. 
Arya is, is embarking on a quest to being a um, a, a, a psychopath, a, a personal killer, and yeah. Sansa is on the road for being a, 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 a demagogue or sociopath in the sense that she's going to command other people to do uh, a whole lot more killing. Right. Interesting. Yeah, like Arya is headed for for physical violence while Sansa is headed for, um, uh, how do I call it, um, more yeah, mani of a, Manipulating manipu other people into it. Yeah. Manipulative violence, like not not direct violence, but indirect violence, She's where where true power so. actually resides, because true power mm. does not reside in the muscle, but in the ability to use the muscle of other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's more political, I think. Is perhaps what you're looking for, and and forced to be such yeah. by 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 their own circumstances. Both, circumstance, both yeah. are yeah, both are dancing with their fate. They just have uh, their different circumstances. Yeah, I think what was interesting about the way she she played in that that kind of well, I say courtroom. It wasn't really a courtroom, but where they were trying to ascertain how, uh, the events of uh, of Liza's Aunt Liza's death. Um, um, she played them really well, like a fiddle, and uh, uh, she knows what her her best uh, her best foot. She knows how to put her best foot forward in, if she's going to be lying in the stuff like that so um, she did that very convincingly well she can be a, a, a sh I think she finally realized that she could be a victim she could continue to be a victim of the circumstances or take control and actually join the join evil join the abuser become herself an abuser that's yeah. her best bet to survive and I don't think she had an awful lot of choice because the, you know like she said who am I going to um, trust in um, the, the the devil I know or the devil I don't know, you know. And um, so she hedged, hedged her bets in that regard, I think. And she felt, yeah, she felt kind of, um, oh, there's, there's, you know, I have, to, I now have to think for myself, you know. And, um, but, yeah, really interesting. But I, let's get back to um, perhaps the beginning part because we're <laughs> covering the end part, which is fine. But, but um, let's go back to the beginning part. And you found, you said you found the... Um, Beginning, the, the first couple of episodes really hard to um, to follow. Adi, I I must admit I found them really, particularly the first one, of course, with um, Joffrey's death and stuff, which was probably the most uh, exciting moment. <laughs> probably the only <laughs> character that I really actually didn't mind um, dying. Frankly, he was uh, the most horrid of all the characters. I think, um, obviously, built up that way. But um, yeah, I found um, I must admit I found that quite exciting, and obviously meeting Prince Oberyn, who's like a kind of this amazing charismatic sort of um, chap that comes, you know, comes in the dead of night, doesn't doesn't stand on ceremony, you know, spends all his time in whorehouses. <laughs> Yeah, Prince uh, Prince Oberyn probably is my favorite character so far. I mean, I I love uh, especially the interaction with uh, um, Tyrion Lannister when he is in jail. But you mentioned uh, I think we're talking about two begin two different beginnings. When I talk about the fact that it was hard for me to get into the show, I'm talking about the first two three episodes of the first season. Oh, where sorry. We are, okay. Yeah, where we are introduced to the House Stark, yeah. and uh, uh, it was really hard for me for the longest time. I was like, I don't, I don't see what you guys see in the Game of Thrones. It's all confusing. Is all so I had to, I had to watch, I think twice, if not three times, the first two or three episodes to mm. get my bearing because we, I, I felt like we were introduced to so many characters. Yeah. That I was very confused. I didn't know exactly who was who and who was fighting who and who was friends with uh, whom. And um, uh, it took me a while to get into it. But after going through those two, three episodes, oh, the show got me. <laughs> I was I was all into it, and I couldn't stop watching. Yeah, I think you're right. I do remember. I do recall those first uh, first episodes a little bit. Struggling. I remember when people were saying, "Oh, it's a great series," and I, I started watching it. Like you, I think it took me about two episodes to really get into it. But um, yeah, yeah, that's that's um, that's going way back, of course. And um, that's uh, most of those characters, of course, disappeared now. 
Um, I think obviously there's Jamie and um, Syrian and um, a few of the, a few of the others. And uh, but yeah, but going back to um, okay, going back to the last season, one of the um, I think one of the really um, poignant things to me, of course, it's like you say, it was about power and stuff like that. But I think you mentioned something about, um, oh gosh, I can't remember now. You said something about, um, okay. so yeah, you talked about the idea of um, about people seeking power through illusion or those sorts of things and family and all that kind of thing. And like Pim just said earlier as well, of course, he mentioned about how none of the, uh, when you put all your eggs into one, when any character puts all their eggs into one basket, essentially they, they often meet a, um, meet a desperate fate, you know, of death normally. And the most recent one, uh, or I say uh, the most uh, recent one, was probably um, Lord Dauntus or, or Sir Dauntus, or I think it was Sir Dauntus or whatever, who um, I guess... In, Poor chap didn't really have much chance, of course, and he's a very side some side character. But um, yeah, there is this there is this kind of um, hopelessness that they they can't connect with each other. That they're always forever in some kind of um, conflict with each other or potential conflict with each other, and um, there does there doesn't seem to be any room at all for um, for loyalty. Um, or for sticking to one thing or the other, you know. Um, I mean, even like um, somebody like um, uh, uh, Stanos, right? He he still has to rely on the Iron Bank. Um, he can't rely on religion solely, you know, on the, you know, on his religious affairs at all. So you know, they're all they're all caught in this kind of um, particular trap. And one of the one of the things most poignant parts about this. Uh, the last series, at least, uh, the fourth season, was um, obviously the build-up towards Tyrion. Um, Tyrion gets obviously accused of killing Joffrey, which of course he, he didn't do. But um, and there's this, there's these, there's these wonderful conversations between um, uh, Tyrion and um, and um, Jamie, and there's also a good, great conversation between Oberyn, which is perhaps a separate one, but. These kind of seem to encapsulate the difficulties that they were experiencing. Except, you do you do sense a certain bond, a certain closeness, a certain loyalty, at least uh, you know, at least perhaps from uh, from Jamie's side, in a sense, I guess, um, perhaps more so than Tyrion. Although, because Tyrion is obviously in the in a very difficult position of being tried for murder and does, has to sort of clutch at straws at every last end but there's this um, the fam this I think encapsulates this whole series for me in many ways and then we'll obviously talk about it perhaps more in detail but it encapsulates the problem that all these people have is there literally is no loyalty in blood at all I mean there's there's none whatsoever I mean um, there's, there's, there's obviously a pretense to it and there are moments of um, great loyalty. I guess you could argue that um, uh, uh, Theon's sister, of course, went to try and rescue him in this particular instance. That was a failed attempt, etc. She lost all, all loyalty for him when she realised that he'd kind of succumbed to the um, to the uh, torture of um, what's his name, Snow. But, um, Ramsey. Ramsey Snow, yeah. No. So, um, yeah, so th this I think is probably the most interesting part to this um, this whole series, at least uh, from my perspective, I think it's um, the most uh, poignant part of it. Um, what do what what you guys think about that at all? Pam, you want to take it away? I feel like I've been talking way too much. <laughs> Because I do have a f several things to say about it, but I'm going to let you uh, take the lead on this one. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I hope this answers your your question. So I think that uh, uh, most most of the characters they have been given a kind of direction in how they see the world, and mm -hmm. how they try to manipulate the world uh, 
uh, um, for whatever reason they believe they should. So I think, for example, the Lannisters, they 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 are identified as the the, the 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 golden the golden lions because they have their gold mines. That's where they get their wealth from, and that is an exhaustible source of income. That is so so they they are identified as people who use uh, resources until they are uh, depleted. And then they move on to something else, or have to move on to something else. So that's what they do with their land, but that's also what they do with their people. They exhaust the people until the people are no longer useful to them, and then they discard them and move on to someone else. So they used uh, um, all their ties to the Targaryens for right. as long as they could, uh, until it was exhausted, and then they moved on to the Baratheons. And they exhausted the Baratheons, and now they are using the Tyrells. And the Tyrells they come from uh, uh, an, an area in Westeros called the Reach, uh, which is a very uh, lush and green and uh, uh, fruitful land. So the Tyrells are like the happy, cheery, invest in relationships, renewable energy kind of people. Uh, and that's how they form relationships and how they exploit their lands. Uh, the Starks, they come from the north, which is harsh, and you have to really, really, really believe it uh, in order to want to live there. You have to kind of uh, almost, uh, um, as they say in Dutch, uh, uh, have a plank in front of your head, <laughs> a board in front of your head, um, in order to want to live there. And that's, and that's how they use their people. Uh, uh, the, people don't, the, the people have to worship the Starks. They, don't, they are not paid by the Starks. They are paid in honor, which is, of course, uh, uh, bullshit. Right. So I think that's, that's a kind of interesting paradigm that all these people have, and that's how how you should, I think, uh, look at a character like Tywin Lannister. That's how he views the world, and that's how he uses his relationships. Is, does, is that an answer to your question? No, no, it does. Yeah, I mean, it certainly it certainly shows how they how they um, very much look at the real the reality of the situation they're in and use it to their uh, supposed best uh, best uh, way you know and of course I like the idea that they use they use up a resource until it's until the bitter end because that does seem they don't seem to invest very well in the future <laughs> uh, they, yeah, they which, keep... which is also interesting because and, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is in the, in the books it's been it's been too long I can't remember but in the series of course they've announced that the gold mines are depleted which That's is kind nice. of an idea that, that that the end is coming, that this depleted resource has to be replaced by a renewable kind of thing, which is the Tyrells. Yeah, well, of course, they did mention that. I think, um, I can't remember which episode it was, perhaps it was episode seven or eight, um, where Tywin talks to Cersei and tells her about the depleted mines. In fact, they've been depleted for several several years, if not a decade or so, according to that. So, um, yeah, they're, they're going into Hock now with the, with the Iron Bank. And, of course, he mentioned the the, iron, the debt that's owed to the Iron Bank. So, yeah, they are in a, in, a, in a position, they are in a situation of debt, the Lannisters will be. Yeah, but if you, if you guys think about it, all these powerful people are pretty much at the mercy of the Iron Bank. I mean, the the the... Baratheons and uh, uh, mm. Robert before he died, and then Joffrey and and now uh, his uh, brother are in debt to Lannisters to the Lannisters. Now Lannisters are uh, they have been borrowing heavily from the Iron Bank. Mm. Uh, Stannis is going to the Iron Bank. Uh, I mean, pretty much all the power is uh, uh, manipulated from the shadows by the bankers, which totally is a, an amazing parallel with the world today. And uh, as I mentioned before, especially um, financing both sides of a war. Mm. Uh, I, I love uh, how the writer and then the, the producers of the show uh, portrayed this very, very clearly. Um, I think uh, this is a, a very important show that people are watching it, but uh, it puts forward uh, concepts that are very important and very actual, very, uh, very much uh, up to date with what's going on in the world right now. And, and I also think that this is a show that will help uh, open uh, the eyes of the masses to the realities of our world even further. Yeah, I, I do think that the Iron Bank will be a, will probably be um, a serious factor in the in the next 
I, perhaps perhaps not so much in the next season, but so if any future seasons um, take place, I, I think they're going to be a very pivotal part of it. So, uh, Pim, uh, since you've read the books, and of course, of course, without uh, uh, giving anything away, anything of importance away, uh, could you please uh, tell us if uh, we're right on this one? Is the Iron Bank going to start uh, showing up more in the next seasons? Is it? Uh, are we right about the pivotal role that it's going to play in the development of the story? Well, I'm definitely not going to spoil anything, so I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna answer this question. I don't know how to answer it without spoiling. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, but but I'm, I'm. I'm curious though, because um, I, I. I see, uh, from from what we've seen in the series so far, I've seen that the Iron Bank uh, uh, is like this this puppet master who is behind uh, um, each party in the war, financing them all. Um, how how is that not already pivotal? And. Oh. What kind of pivotal moment would you be expecting? Yeah, I know what you mean. I think um, I I see it as perhaps um, where it will become more um, the the, res the lack of resources perhaps and uh, those uh, that particularly the Lannisters need um, or pr pretty much have relied on, and so having a having a change or having to deal with a with that kind of change might actually um, might actually more pivotal, I guess, for them than perhaps the Iron Bank being pivotal. But, but I see it as a minus, minor part, like in a sense that they'll always be there in the background. Um, but those debts will um, finally start to catch up potentially with the Lannisters. You know. Well, the the Iron Bank, uh, just as the Tyrells, represent the another aspect of power, which is wealth and money. So uh, in the race that I mentioned before. Uh, between these concepts, <clears throat> the Iron Bank would be one of the players. So if they come on top in the end, which I assume to cert to some extent they will always they al they always will. Um, but it's see, it's hard it's hard for you to to direct us to 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 show us uh, in a direction yeah. or other without giving it away. It's so. speculation, isn't it? Really? Yeah. 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 What what I could say about that, <clears throat> and this is uh, this is just and this these are my thoughts. This is this is not uh, uh, anything that I that I've read or anything. But my my thought about this is that the the the, uh, the Iron Bank represents this this old world, um, this old world way of dealing th with. Uh, um, with how to finance these wars and how to make sure that uh, these wars can keep going, and I think it's very much related to, um, of course, the banking world that we see today, but also to uh, to oil and uh, uh, depletable energy sources. Whereas the Tyrells represent uh, the um, solar, Producers, wind, the, water, the power. agriculture's. Uh, well, yeah, maybe agriculture, but more uh, rather. Um, uh, like renewable energy, uh, um, fossil fuel, that sort of thing. Yeah, but the, uh, the the opposite of fossil fuels. So the 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 Iron Bank and the the, the Lannisters are are are, are uh, comparable to fossil fuels, which is like coming to an end and and stuff. Right. And uh, uh, of what we need now is to move to renewable energy, which is the Tyrells. Um And I'm not sure if that's a conscious or an unconscious theme. If it's even a theme at all, it's just something that I think I see. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, that's about as much I think as I can say about that without. Any sure. Spoilers. So um, one of the more exciting um, parts, I mean, particularly in the first episode, of course, we see Arya um, having her first uh, her first uh, killing essentially, and uh, this takes place in that tavern, I think, with the King's Guard. And uh, she discovers, obviously, it's, it's actually not her first. Her first killing, I think, is in season one when she stabbed a boy in the belly. That yeah, when, true, she escapes, when she escapes, when she escapes the court. That is true. You're okay. right. Absolutely. I, Thanks for. But I, I would say that that was uh, her first killing. But what we're talking about now would be her first murder. If, uh, if you, if if that's a distinction I can make. I think that would be the distinction. You're right. Yes, it, it's, it certainly seemed like. Um, uh, you know, a first uh, uh, foray into that sort of thing, because most of the time she kind of avoided it, really. Yeah, and, because uh, the fir her first kill, if I remember correctly, it was um, 
uh, kind of an accident. Like she turns around and then she, by almost by mistake, she's by mistake she stabs this uh, this boy. In fact, she's surprised at at what what happened. But uh, <clears throat> the tavern scene uh, that is uh, in the tavern scene, that's when she makes her first intentional kill. So yeah. as Pim said, the first murder. Mm. But I mean, how did um? I mean, I, uh, I mean that story. Of, um, the, there was a really, I think, quite a rich story um, being, throughout the whole of that season, um, being told between um, that that um particular scene in the tavern to the eventual um, fight with uh, Brienne and um, his and the Hound's eventual. She eventually, obviously, leaves him dying there, and we all know why she kind of left him there and didn't didn't kill him and she took his silver and stuff like that but I mean um there was really a that that relationship kind of what dipped and ebbed and flowed is the way I could describe it I guess you know uh, there was a certain amount of empathy and then there was a complete like oh, why am I you know this is from Aria I'm thinking you know she you know connected with him at times particularly about around the Hearing a story about his brother burning, um, scarring him with that burn and stuff, and again, it sort of comes back to this family situation, this fa this kind of constant refrain of um, families, uh, family breakdown or uh, lack of trust, etc., or favoritism, nepotism, whatever you want to call it. I guess. Um, what What did people make of that story? And what was their thoughts on it? Hmm. Okay. Uh, are you you're talking about the story between uh, the time that Arya spends with the Hound? Yeah, the the, the basically mm -hmm. from that time at the King's Garden and you know to his. So, mentor. the the time that Arya spent with uh, the Hound, uh, I think it's a it's a very important uh, period in her life and in her 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 path to become a sociopath. I mean, he mentors her. He is her mentor, right. mentor in in the art of killing and the the, the art of psychopathy. Because uh, we know from previous episodes that the hound loves killing most of all, more than sex, more than money, more than anything else. He is the that a, a true psychopath, and he's got that physical strength that he can <clears throat> that that plays very well in in right. this um, in this thing. So so the time that she spends with him. Is that is a uh, is a learning learning period for her on how to become ruthless and how to love to kill people? Because yeah. she even plans her killings, doesn't she, with that with those uh, naming people out loud? Yeah, so. and uh, yeah, yeah, and not only but not only that, but after she leaves, <clears throat> after she leaves uh, um, her brother. Uh, who is dead, Rob Stark, mm. and she sees him, uh, uh, his body mutilated and everything. If you remember, there's a scene where those uh, soldiers are in the woods and are talking about uh, what happened at the wedding with Rob Stark's murder and her mother's murder, uh, Kathleen Stark, and uh, she stops. She just jumps from the horse and she uh, she engages them. And at the end of that, the hound doesn't tell her don't do it again or hey this is bad or hey you know you can't just kill people like that he says hey next time maybe give me a heads up maybe give me a warning and then we'll do it together so he actually the hound empowers her psychopathy and, right. and it, it brings it out of her so the time she spends with him is a crucial time I think in the development of this character and where I think the story is gonna take this character the character of Aria yeah, she's gonna. I think she's gonna turn into quite the, um, quite the uh, psychopath into the future. I think um, as she gets older. Yeah, and then she has another sort of mentor in uh, the, the, what's his name? Uh, the guy from Bravos. The faceless man. The, the faceless, faceless assassin. man. Yes, yes, and um, and he teaches her like like the hound teaches her brute and ruthless violence. The other guy teaches her intelligent uh, <laughs> murderous stealth. violence you know yeah. stealth and uh, like well, I think we're gonna see throughout areas path all these mentors that are gonna just put another uh, are gonna teach her another thing and another thing to make her 
the absolute best killer and the most feared psychopath that one can ever imagine. Right. That's interesting. I hadn't considered that at all. So that's a really that's a really interesting idea. And it makes complete sense that that's what she potentially can will become. Yeah. Unless of course they kill her off. <laughs> Which you can never <laughs> tell with Game of Thrones of course because as we as we had of course uh, in with um poor old um Tyrion's uh, champion uh, in Prince Oberyn. Um, one of the sh big shockers, of course, was that oh. dreadful. I can't, couldn't watch that scene again. I, I knew it was coming, so I, I, I just, and I knew it was the end, so I just let it just get to the point where I knew it wasn't good. <laughs> but it's pretty, pretty brutal. Um, but of course, you know, again, makes a lot of sense. Um, this, uh, there's this. There's this sense of revenge which uh, always seems to um, catch people out in this in this whole series. Um, I mean, it's not the only thing, of course, but it is one particular point, and that's why I guess I kind of think about Arya, and she is kind of on a revenge, or at least heading towards that. And um, I wonder whether that will be her downfall, but who knows? <laughs> Yeah, and it's really interesting to see one of the weakest characters have uh, the, it starts to to gain so much power. Like Arya, Arya. First of all, she's uh, a girl, uh, and girls in that world are usually uh, pretty much uh, pawns to be sold uh, and yeah. to be owned. And she's a child, so uh, to see the one of the weakest pa characters, uh, the path to I, I I wouldn't call it empowerment. Um, the path to to psychopathy and murder and uh, uh, violence. Uh, I, I'm really curious to see where they're going to take this. And of course, another very weak character is uh, uh, Bran, her little brother, mm -hmm. who is even weaker. I mean, he doesn't even have the use of his legs, but he has uh, these magical powers, these supernatural powers of inhabiting right. uh, wild animals and and more probably in the future other people as yeah. we've seen in the scene with uh, Hodor. Yeah, yeah, he definitely has power but it's a different kind of course, yeah. Be before we move on uh, too far away from Arya, I w would like to mention uh, um, mm. something about her. Um, I think and this is this is another pedantic distinction. And I'm really sorry about throwing those in, but I think I think there's value in them, so I'm, I keep doing it. Uh, I think Arya is not being taught. I think Arya learns from, um, with the difference being that she is in control of uh, of her direction, mm. and she absorbs from him, her teachers what she wills. So she's had at least three significant uh, teachers, being Sirio Farrell, the Faceless Assassin, and of course the Hound. And um, with each of those, she becomes um, a little bit better at one aspect of being an um, an assassin, which is what she wants to be, uh, judging from how she responded to the faceless uh, assassin. But but is this really something that she chooses, or is she the victim of her circumstances? And as all children, you know, she imprints on whoever she comes in contact with. I mean, her first. Uh, let's call him teacher, was her dance master and that was chosen by her indeed. But then um, the faceless assassin, she just comes in contact with him and, and the circumstances are uh, of such nature that she actually needs his help. Then the hound takes her uh, uh, hostage. I don't think there's much choice there. What do you think about the, that, Pim? I think I think that um, I think that for a hostage, she certainly took the hound a lot of places. <laughs> um, and, and I, th I think it's important. I think I think the whole theme of Arya is is already explained in in season one, which is just water dancing. That's what she does. She gets all these things thrown at her, and she tangos with it, and she. She, she, she has this this kind of mental agility to just deal with whatever is thrown her way and find a path to first deal with it 
and then overcome it and finally avenge it. That's kind of what I expect of Arya. Right. Yeah, my thoughts with her is that she's kind of she's kind of in the midst of a, a quite a traumatic events, and I think she her number one position is to survive. And well, that makes sense of a lot of children. Of course, they they, they go through trauma. Of course, their their reasoning is to is to survive, etc., and to find the best possible way. And of course, if you're given mentors that provide violent solutions, and of course, that's where she's um going to head, of course. So I think it's a, I think she's, it's a she's not overtly vote. violent in the sense of the hound that she wants no, to no. fight. She wants to like. The way the, the 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 moments that she took took physical violent action uh, were when things were already uh, uh, in her favor. She 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 awaits the odds uh, until they are in her favor, and then she strikes. And that's exactly what she did with the hound. She waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and waited, and finally, when the hound is no longer useful to her. She ditches him, which is, I think, a very uh, cool moment for her as a Stark. You know, a Stark would not leave the Hound there. That's not a Stark thing to do, but Arya does it. So in that sense, she breaks with her family, which is why she, for the moment, lives, I think. Right. Yeah, yeah because loyalty and honor, uh, she, uh, children learn very quickly. I mean, she saw where loyalty and honor and allegiance were did that um, what what that did to her father so uh, she I think she learned that lesson very well so I, I highly doubt that we're gonna see area in the future being subject of uh, the illusions and the manipulation of people in power she's gonna I think she's gonna encompass a little bit of uh, um, several concepts like uh, the brute violence and then the individuality and the independence of the free thinker um, free will and is not bound by any of the illusions that killed um, her father. Mm -hmm. Right. And of course, there's, that really in there's also that other interesting scene where they're going up to Aunt Liza's and of course they find out <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that she's died. <laughs> and of course she oh. ends up bursting into laughter quite, <clears throat> quite uh, seemingly inappropriately of course, but uh, but, um, well, that's kind of a nervous laughter, you know, like oh, yeah, yeah. several times she thought she was at the end of the journey, several times she thought that she was finally going to be reunited with her, her family, and when that um, mm -hmm. also, uh, she sees that that is not the case again, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, she was taken to the wall to be reunited with her uh a half brother, Jon Snow, and that didn't go well. Then the Hound takes her to Rob Stark, and that is another tragedy there. When she uh, yeah, yeah. gets to the point, to the gates of the Vale, and she finds out that, hey, here's another member of my family who's dead. That's that's some psychopathic laugh right there. That she I think she's mostly laughing at the Hound. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I hadn't looked at it from your perspective, which is definitely insightful, I think. Um, but I think she's also laughing. You know, she because she looks at the hound as she's laughing. There is a sarcastic laughter in there. Yeah, I, I get that as well. Yeah, she, um, it's funny because there is this deep frustration, of course, with the you you get embedded with the characters, and one of the things you think, oh, it'd be quite nice if she actually met, she'll meet Stansa, and of course, she they never went in, so they never Stansa never sees her or whatever, and so that's they just decide not to go in, of course, and. Um, and so they miss each other at that point, of course, at the very end, of course, with um, with Brienne, of course, she she does a runner, of course, decides not to uh, not to um, not to go off with Brienne, although we don't know what may or may, or may not happen, of course, in the new series, perhaps they well, she I catch think, up with her. I think that's the moment when uh, she just breaks free from her family because every time it seems that she wants to she she almost gets reunited with them another member of her family is just killed and her family is decimated one by one so I think after the veil even when Brienne says hey listen I'm gonna take you um, uh, to be safe I'm gonna take you to be reunited with your family she she ju she just completely loses interest because you know I mean she learned that Every time she gets close to her family, one of them just dies in front of her eyes. And this is why I think she embarks 
for the journey to Bravos right. because she's not going to go back to her family. There, there is no more family. Just to see them die, it's not. Uh, and and I think that that's. I think you're right, Pim. In a way, she laughs at the hound, but there's that. I mean, you just learned that yet another member of your family died. If you people that laugh in those kind of moments are that's a kind of a deranged and nervous laughter. Hmm. Yeah. Actually, and it's interesting going particularly on this theme of um, being let down by family or or at least uh, understanding the, the family situation better. Of course, there's Tyrion, right? And we go back to um, the story with, um, with him in prison, of course, and, um, and Prince Oberyn. Uh, finally decides to be his champion, and there's a very good scene in that which I know Pim wants to talk about, and um, which I think is uh, kind of um, encapsulates some of the the feelings of Tyrion, of course, and and also you know again this whole thing of you know loyalty to family, etc. So yeah, what what were your thoughts on that particular scene? You, you remember the one I'm talking about, of course. Yes, yes, I do. And uh, I think also that it's uh, worth pointing out how different uh, Oberyn's visit is for Tyrion uh, compared to Jaime's. Um, Oberyn's visit has a deep, uh, a deep. They, they almost share this deep emotional connection that Tyrion just can't get from Jaime. Um, there really is nothing more between Tyrion and Jaime than blood, and uh, Oberyn has this. I, I mean, I, I I completely love that character, which is is weird because I, um, like uh, he he one of the opening scenes of Oberyn in in Westeros or in uh, in King's Landing is uh, quite violent, and uh, uh, he's by any objective standard not a lovable character at all. <laughs> um, but the way that the Oberyn character influences the other storylines and the way in which he is different from the other characters is just so lovable. Um, I, I find him m the most enjoying, uh, uh, enjoyable character in uh, yeah. in this season. Yeah, I would agree with you. He, um, on, the, on first hand, you think, oh, he's a bit of a, he's a bit of a rogue. I mean, there's that ghastly scene where he, he uh, stabs, um, stabs one of the, uh, <laughs> one of the yeah. brothel um, customers in the hand. You know, <laughs> and you think, oh my god, this guy's another psycho that's uh, arrived on. Westeros shores, you know, but uh, he does turn into a much more complex and more, um, yeah, more empathic character. I think mm -hmm. he certainly, certainly, like you say, connects with Tyrion's childhood. Of course, in this particular scene where he's been told all these awful stories about this monster and stuff like that, and then when he, of course, when he sees um, Tyrion um, as a baby. Um, he sees him as a baby and not as um, not as a monster, which of course yeah. And I think the deep, deep emotional connection between them, between Tyrion and uh, Oberyn, in that in that scene is uh, because for the first time, if I'm not mistaken, throughout the whole movie, uh, Tyrion is being told by somebody that he's not a monster. He's actually seen yes. as a person. Because if you remember, if you guys remember, the conversation started with uh, Oberyn telling him, "Hey, you were the greatest disappointment." And uh, mm -hmm. you see Tyrion like he cringes, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah, yeah. One, once again, somebody tells me that I'm a disappointing a disappointment, and then he goes on with the story, telling him how he expected a monster, and what he does is he portrays how society sees. Tyrion, and he's very used to that. That is how he functions. He even mm. says, uh, "Wear your weaknesses out on your sleeves, and nobody can hurt you." Uh, mm. But then he totally takes down the walls, the defensive walls that that Tyrion has built throughout the years, and practically tells him, "Hey, you are just a baby. Yeah, your head was a little bit bigger. Yeah, your body was a little bit weird, but you're a baby." So. It seems to me that in that scene, Tyrion is seen for the first time by another person as uh, just a child, you know, mm. uh, uh, 
he connects yep. with the vulnerability of his childhood and mm. uh, his defenses. I mean, the, the reaction, the actor is just fantastic in that scene, the reaction on his face. I agree. You can practically see all his defenses coming down and he's, he has that moment of, uh, of extreme, uh, um, how should I call it? Um, well, we call it enlightened wis uh, enlightenment yes. or enlightened wit witness. Of course, is a, a phrase that's used for somebody who, you know, who, who does connect with um, you in, as in your childhood in that, in a real way. You know, yeah, there was someone who was like there. It's about yeah, it's someone who was there and saw what it was like, but was not part of it. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a it's a term coined by uh, by Alice Miller, uh, which yeah. is a mm -hmm. great resource to read if you're into that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it is. Yeah, so a very a, a very moving scene, and um and I think um yeah, it's a, it's a moment of vulnerability for Tyrion that he's like you say unexpected, and uh, yeah, it's very very uh, uh it sort of underpins the lack of connection that so many of these people, so many of the characters have with their families, and of course eventually, of course Tyrion ends up um, murdering his father. And um, of course, his father humiliates him in the most uh, in the most grotesque way. Of course, by sleeping with um, with Shay or taking Shay as his kind of concubine or whatever they call it in in that in that series. But um, but yeah, or whore, I suppose is what they call it. But um, yeah, that was also another very powerful scene. I thought very palpable scene. Um, you know. Um, of course, it seemed to hinge very much. His death seemed to hinge on him referring on the Tyr Tywin referring to um, Shay as a whore, of course. But um, I think the um, I think the real bitterness came from uh, being described as a monster all his life, you know, and his father never defending him in that regard, you know. Yeah, that's a that's a very powerful scene when Tyrion actually is free. From uh, his desire uh, to get his father's approval, and I think the the mm. the, the conversation with uh, Oberyn helps him um, helps him overcome that that incredible desires that Tyrion has to to make his father proud, to be accepted, to be part of the family. So when he's finally seen as a person and not as a monster, not as a, a dwarf or a you know a deformed. Uh, human being he understands that hey you know i i i am human uh, and and these are, these are not the people that i should seek approval from my father is has never seen me this way so so he has this revelation in the dungeon which i think plays an important role in in uh, him being free yeah from uh, from his father that's a good point very good point but speaking speaking of children, there's another another thing that I wanted to talk about uh, in the Game of Thrones. You know, Game of Thrones, yes, it's about power, but <clears throat> power seems to revolve around the ability to make children and control them. Right. So the Game of Thrones is not only a show about power, but but it's also a show about family and about incredible child abuse. Mm. So the most notable psychopathic child abuser, uh, I think it's uh, Craster, who marries his daughters and sacrifices his sons. Uh, and, uh, you know, although oh, the yeah. disposable, disposable male theme permeates throughout the whole show, oh, gosh. It, is, <laughs> it is never never as clearly portrayed as in the episodes where we meet Craster. No, he's awful, isn't he? <laughs> the worst yeah. character of all. Creepy so, old guy. Uh, on the second place in the child abusers top, uh, I would put, um, I think I would put Balon Greyjoy, right. Theon's father. Uh, he's the lord of the Iron Islands. Mm. And um, <clears throat> he gives his son to the house of Stark as practically a spoil of war. And uh, then when Theon finally returns home after years of captivity, um, <clears throat> Balon Greyjoy rejects him, you know, and projects upon him all the guilt that he feels for the for the decision for his own decision of giving him away. Right. Uh, on third place, I think I would put Tywin Lannister, who openly uses his children as pawns. I mean, mm. practical pawns in his psychopathic chase of power. 
Mm. The, the Tyrells are also, they also use their children as pawns and uh, you know we get to see Marjorie being auctioned off to the highest bidder. I mean <laughs> yeah. not once, not twice, but three times already. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> in a desperate chase to the throne, the, the, Tyrell, the Tyrells, uh, they have her marry first uh, Randy Baratheon, then Joffrey and by the looks of it she will, she will wed uh, I think Tommen. That's his name. Yeah, yeah, this Tommen. Yeah. And uh, she will marry him and, and finally become queen. You know, ensuring this way a powerful position for her family. Yeah. So. I, yeah, I think the child abuse or the uh, really is encapsulated. A lot of that is encapsulated in the um, the White Walkers. You know, with the child sacrifice. Yes. That seems to be kind of. Almost like, because it's kind of supernatural and it's sort of, there seems to be a large metaphor there. And that and really seems to come to um, light how children are used as, uh, literally as used as, um, uh, to protect them from obviously bad things happening to them, mythical things in the case of the White Walkers. Although, of course, in the sense the White Walkers are real in this, I, I suppose, but... Um, but there is this um, the child sacrifices is I think the uh, and it's not the, quite the, even a child sacrifice because the White Walkers we see in the last in the last mm. season they're not killing the children they're transforming them yes so uh, what they do and I think it's a very uh, important metaphor they take that child and 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 take it up north in the deserted lands of ice and cold and and we see this white walker just touching this child this newborn child and taking all the warmth out of him and turning him into an ice pretty much ice child I think that's a metaphor of of sucking out all the good and the empathy and all the the, right. the totally the warmth that children have and turning them you know through abuse and through trauma into into icicles practically as far yeah, as uh, yeah. their internal I, I, universe I, is concerned. I think it's not through abuse, abuse and trauma but through abandonment. And I think the, the red god is abuse and trauma and the, uh, the blue god is uh, abandonment. Okay, could you explain the difference between the blue and the red god, Pim? I'm, I'm uh, I mean, familiar. I don't know if it's called the blue god. We haven't really right. met any, any about it but it's the north. The, um, Sure. The old gods, or whatever, whatever is behind the White Walkers, or maybe just the White Walkers themselves. And the Red God would be the Lord of Light. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Ah, uh, right. Okay. I must admit, I thought I thought the 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 child sacrifice was more about neglect, but that's that's interesting. Abandonment that, that definitely is more um more uh, more um that connects better, I think. But yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, it's, about it's, yeah, it's on the same scale, I guess, being much worse even. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah I indeed we have uh, trauma and then we have abandonment. I mean, uh, for example, the Stark children uh, uh, have been traumatized beyond recognition. <clears throat> As we said before, Sansa had to witness the beheading of her father. She was uh, threatened, humiliating, humiliated and, and even beaten. Mm. Arya, of course, had to survive on her own and she turned into a killer. Bran was paralyzed. <clears throat> by Jaime and Cersei, uh, which are people that his uh, his parents welcomed into their home. But then we have the abandonment aspect of uh, um, the the children that were abandoned, and these are, I think, mostly the bastards. You know, Jon Snow, Ramsay Snow, Gendry, the blacksmith. Um, these are children that nobody really cares about. They're cast to the side and and treated almost like subhumans. Yeah, and the only the, sorry, go on, maybe. They're, they're the, no, I just wanted to say they're their parents. It seems like they are their parents' constant reminder of their mistakes. And right. you know, while while Jon Snow is sent away to the wall, Ramsay has to prove his psychopathy to to this merciless father. And and poor Gendry has to flee to save his life, uh, and then only to be captured by his uncle in an attempt to sacrifice him to the Lord of Light. So, in the Game of Thrones, everyone wants to be a king, and children are used as pawns in this uh, uh, psychopathic game for power. Yeah, yeah. The only child that gets any kind of um, uh, any kind of sense of um, of care, I think, is um, 
I'm trying to remember the name of the character now, but there's the there's the lady up in the north um, with the the one of the chaps who's um, who saved her from the White Walkers or whatever. Um, that baby gets some kind of um, you know gets some kind of care. I mean, even when the uh, the wildlings come in to um, to basically pillage the town, uh, uh, pillage that village. Of course, um, um, we we have um, we have the the no, I can't can't recall um, John Snow's girlfriend, I guess. <laughs> oh, Egret. Egret, yeah. She um she decides to um you know to um pass you know to to spare um, her. Spare her, you know. So and um and of course she's a very seemingly of course a very good mother, you know. So uh, so it's uh, that's the only that's the only um sense you get of um nurture or um, maternal maternal sort of um, nurturing in the whole show I think at least in that series you know, in that season yeah well moreover at least from uh, from whether she's a good mother or not she is probably the only mother we've seen so far that has good intentions yes yeah because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course what we don't know there is there is uh, there is obviously a you kind of get glimpses of something um, a little bit more darker about her, or more manipulative, perhaps. I don't know, but um, but she, but seemingly she, she's quite young, of course. I think she's like technically, I think she's like around fourteen or something, isn't she, or, or some, some Yeah, well, in the television series, uh, they've aged some of the characters a little bit because sure. at the start, I think Daenerys was supposed to be thirteen, and um, that's right. a little bit young to have sex with a big brute. Well, that was roughly where we came to a close, and um, I just wanted to tail back for a couple of moments regarding the last part of that um, conversation where we were talking about child sacrifice, and particularly in regards to abandonment. Um, it seems to me to be quite a significant part of this show. Abandonment seems to be a large part of it. I mean, one of the most uh, obvious figures who doesn't figure particularly highly in the fourth series, although he, he's there, of course, when his, sis, when, he tries to, when his sister tries to save him, is Theon Greyjoy, of course. He was abandoned by his father, um, I think, when he was five, I think, but anyway, I might be wrong on that, but certainly he was abandoned at a young age, and um, by Balon Greyjoy, of course, and then roundly rejected, I think it was in the second series, perhaps, um, where he was roundly rejected by his father, um, accused of um, being born of gold and not iron, of course, being from the Iron Islands. But yeah, abandonment seems to be a, a, something that figures quite highly in Game of Thrones, and I think that's true of even um, the Starks, you know, the way in which um, Ned Stark's loyal, loyalty got his head chopped off and left it, left his two very young daughters stranded in a very really difficult uh, uh, situation so I think that's something to consider and I think um, I mean I think what the new series will bring I'm really looking forward to how they work with Tyrion's character as well as Arya's character and um, yeah that's about it um, just wanted a quick apology for the lateness of the show I've had a few difficulties with I've had some other commitments elsewhere. We've had some terrible problems with um, the mechanics of getting this recording put together. Uh, not just this one, but also the previous one. I hope to have High Plains Drifter out within a couple of weeks. Um, but anyway, I hope you enjoy the new series that's coming, of course, um, very soon, if not already. <laughs> but um, yeah, well, um, bye for now.